Hello, I am Dr. Ewan Goodyear and I'm a Technical Manager here at Eclipse Magnetics. I'm here today to talk to you about a variety of magnetic materials that are available. Historically, the first magnetic materials were magnetic steels and they were around in the 1920s. From then, we had the Almaco range of magnets. Almaco magnets are a cast magnetic material of aluminium, nickel and cobalt. Historically, they are coated in red for aesthetic reasons mainly and you can see here with our Eclipse logo on them but when you look inside the structure it's actually really pretty granular material within them some of them are actually more columnar in shape and the Colomax range as it used to be known has very columnar crystals with a high direction magnetization direction within the structure from the Almaco materials then came ferrite magnets. Example here, loudspeaker ring. And here, for anyone who is in the separation industry, six by four by one inch ferrite slab. Ferrite magnets, very, very popular for being low cost and high performance. And then later on, we come to the rare earth materials. There are two types actually, the neodymium iron boron, or NDFEB, we sometimes call them NEO magnets. They are regarded as the main rare earth magnetic material, of which here's an example, a nickel coated NEO magnet in a disc format. The other range of rare earth material is samarium cobalt. These tend to be a bit more niche, but we'll talk about applications a little bit later. For the Almaco magnets, these are superb at high temperature applications, working up to 550 degrees C. They also have very good temperature stability, so the BR of them varies the least out of all the main magnetic materials. So in terms of uh, stability applications where you do not want the magnetic output to vary much with temperature at all, these are absolutely brilliant. The downside to Almaco magnets is that they have a low coercivity. When we talk about coercivity, that's how well a magnet will resist being demagnetized, either from temperature and or from an elevated temperature. The Almaco range has a low coercivity. Uh, you may see that in data sheets as HCB or HC, and that means that they are easy to magnetize, they're also easy to demagnetize. So to prevent them being easily demagnetized, they tend to be much longer in the direction of magnetization than they are in the pole face area. A typical rule of thumb is at least four to six to one of the length of length to diameter ratio. We then come to the ferrite range of magnets. Ferrite magnets, also known as ceramic magnets, they are electrically insulating to the standard, which means that they are great for eddy current problems because they cannot generate eddy currents inside them. But the downside is in manufacturing, you cannot wire spark erode them, you need to grind them to shape instead. Ferrite magnets, also known as magnetic rust because they contain iron oxide within them, means that they do not corrode at all when placed in water. The advantages of the ferrite also, they're good for 250 degrees C, maximum operating temperature, and they also resist demagnetization really well. They have high coercivity. And interestingly, the coercivity actually increases as the magnets get hotter. It's the odd one out of the magnetic range. In terms of general applications, the ferrite magnets are really useful in generators and motor applications where they need high performance and high resistance to demagnetization and also where you need the eddy current being reduced to a minimum. We then come to the bonded and flexible magnets. These are basically the magnetic powders that are contained within a binder, usually a rubber or a plastic depending on what uh, the magnet type it is. This version here is a flexible ferrite magnet material and you can make these multiple pole patterns. So you can actually have many poles 
on one side or even on some occasions on both sides. And the magnetization pattern is created during the manufacture of the magnets. This makes these really good in point of sale applications and vehicle graphics. There are two types of rare earth magnets, the Sumerian cobalt magnets and the medium iron boron magnets. The Sumerian cobalt magnets, as shown here, they are very good for ultra low temperature and very high temperature applications. In terms of the ultra low, they are used in space applications where, where they have been known to work at 3 Kelvin. And for high temperature, standard Sumerian cobalt works up to 250, 300 or 350 degrees C. There are also variants which we can offer which go up to 550 degrees C. They have very good temperature coefficients, which means that the output varies very little with temperature change. Not quite as good as the Almaco range, but not far off at all. But they have very high coercivity, so this makes them very, very hard to demagnetize. This makes them very good in aerospace applications, for example. When people talk about rare earth magnets, they usually mean these neo magnets. They are, as you can see, nickel plated. They have some form of corrosion protection plating, usually a nickel copper nickel plating or an epoxy or a zinc. To be honest, there are over 50 to 70 different types of coatings you can put on these magnets, depending on the application. You can even have 22 karat gold if you so wished. The coating is needed because there's iron in the alloy and the magnet will corrode as the iron rusts itself. So neodymium iron boron magnets are not ideal in marine applications where they will get wet regularly. Equally, you do not want them in hydrogen atmospheres because hydrogen will break them down. There's a hydrogen decrepitation process in the manufacture of these magnets and that is known destroy the magnet into a powder when you apply hydrogen. It's how you actually make the magnets and so because of that you should never use a neo-magnet in a hydrogen atmosphere. In terms of performance, the neodymium magnets are the highest performing magnets size for size. Compared to the ferrite magnets size for size, the neo-magnet is up to seven times more powerful. Compared to the Alnico magnets, the BR of them can actually be quite similar. If you get the design right, a Nalico magnet can be nearly as powerful in output as the neodymium magnets, but the neodymium magnets have vastly higher coercivity values, meaning that they resist demagnetization far, far better than the Alnico can. Talking of the resistance to demagnetization, this introduces the coercivity term again, how well a magnet resists being demagnetized. If you demagnetize a magnet, by an externally applied magnetic field or by increasing the temperature on the magnets. When you look at the neodymium data sheets, you'll often see these magnets rated by a temperature rating. It is actually the intrinsic coercivity value that it's rated by, which you may see on the data sheets as HCI, IHC, or HCJ, or even JHC. What this means is that the higher that intrinsic coercivity value is, the harder it is to demagnetize the magnet. And that relates to a temperature rating. So your standard Neo magnets are good for 80 degrees C, maximum recommended operating temperature, and there are other ranges as well. The H range is okay for 120 M, between the two, 100 degrees C, but then it can go higher, SH 150, UH 180, EH 200, and then there's an AH and BH, which are 220 and 250 degrees C versions. But to achieve these higher coercivities, you need to add an element called dysprosium, and that dysprosium is very expensive. The higher the rating, the more dysprosium, the more the cost. So generally speaking, we would look to match the magnet grade for the application. You may see in data sheets a number like N35SH. The N would be NEO. The 35 is an energy product or pH max value. The higher that number, the more powerful the magnet. 
gives you an idea of the higher the PR as well. And the letters at the end relates to the temperature rating, or as I just said a bit earlier, actually the intrinsic coercivity. We also have electromagnets, the energized to hold and the energized to release. These aren't strictly speaking necessarily permanent magnets because the energized hold is literally just a copper coil, but it does have steel work in there. But the energized to release version has a coil and a permanent magnet inside. So this starts to introduce magnetic circuits where you can add the magnetic materials to steel work to create useful products from electromagnets through to halback arrays, motors, or even generators, and even for loudspeaker applications. We match the magnet type to the requirements for the application. As I mentioned earlier, some of the magnet materials need coatings, such as the neo-magnets. You can actually have a range of coatings and you can actually coat more than just the neo-magnets. For example, the alco-magnets may have a coating for aesthetic reasons. The neo-magnets need the coatings against corrosion, but those coatings may be varied depending on the application. For example, some of the automotive applications, instead of having a nickel coating, may have nickel and epoxy. Medical applications may wish to have paraline C or even gold plated on the magnets. These Sumerian cobalt magnets typically don't require any coating, nor do the ferrite ones, but it can be done. Sometimes the ferrite magnets are coated with silver for medical applications, and the Sumerian cobalt magnets may have a nickel coating on them for use inside electrical circuits where you actually solder onto the plating so the magnet actually forms part of the electrical and magnetic circuit. Equally, we can have different coatings to identify different poles. So here we have two types of epoxy colour coatings. Equally, we can overmould the magnets. Here we have a rubber coated neo pot magnet. Equally, we can overmold with plastics. You can also work out the poles of the magnets. A polarity indicator, where depending on which pole there is, you can identify the polarity of the magnets. Equally, we have green viewing film. The viewing film you can place over the magnet and as you can see the dark colour the magnetic field is going through the paper and the lighter colour it is in the plane of the paper. So from this you can see the poles you would need the polarity indicator to identify whether they are north or south but this is another aid to determining the performance of magnets. You can also use gauss meters and they can tell you the polarity of the magnets and the field strengths of the magnets. And often the Gauss meters that we use in applications such as sensors, we are trying to work out whether or not your magnet is triggering at the right field strength at the right distance. You can also visualize the field patterns from the magnets in 3D using iron powder. Bit more. The iron filings uh, follow the magnetic pathways from the magnet. It's a nice way of seeing field patterns. You can also have a similar effect if you use ferrofluids, but ferrofluids can stain materials that it comes in contact with, so you do need to be careful when using that. Using the iron filings is a cleaner method. As for the prices of magnets, this does depend somewhat on the raw material prices at the time of manufacture. But the general rule of thumb is that the ferrite magnets are usually the cheapest magnets size for size, working all the way up to the high temperature Sumerian cobalt magnets being the most expensive. The neodymium magnets tend to be a little bit less expensive than the Sumerian cobalt, and the Arco falls between 
the Neo and the Ferrite. But it, things such as economies of scale, size and shape, complexity of it, the magnetic patterns, how many you want ultimately, and any uh, specialist coatings that you may require, and any particular finishes such as dimensional tolerances or field checks, they all have an impact on the price of a magnet. So some people try to do a dollars per kilogram comparison. It's often very difficult to do so. Uh, you can do a snapshot in time perhaps, but generally speaking, it goes ferrite, armaco, neo, cement, cobalt. But it does depend on the grades that you're comparing as to where each one actually falls into. In terms of magnetic strength, on a size for size basis, we start off with ferrite first, and then Armco or Samarian Cobalt, depending on the size or shape, then the Adhemium Iron Boron as the most powerful. With remembering is in round about a 7 to 1, up to 7 to 1 difference in performance between a size for size Neo and a Ferrite. For corrosion resistance, this does depend a lot on the application. But generally speaking, ferrite magnets are regarded as best for corrosion resistance, closely followed by Sumerian cobalt, then Almaco, and last is probably the Nidimium iron boron. Like I said, it really does depend on the application. For example, a high hydrogen atmosphere application, you would never use a Neo magnet. For very, very high temperature applications, you might not use a Neo, you might be looking at a ferrite. Samarium or Alnico. If the application has very high external magnetic fields, you might not want to use the Alnico. If you want high temperature stability, you might be looking for Alnico or Samarium cobalt. Or if you just want pure low cost, you might be looking at the ferrite again. There's a balance between the application and the material grade to select. You can also use magnets in a variety of applications that require magnetic assemblies. Here an example of a dipole Halbach array. All these magnets have the direction of magnetization shown by the arrows. They actually repel each other in this configuration, so we have to have a retaining ring. But inside, it's a very uniform, very strong magnetic field. In this version, up to one tesla in the center. But you can design versions like this with anything up to two, even higher tesla. And just for note, one tesla is 10,000 gauss. Equally, magnets can be used in motor or generator applications. So we have arc shapes, or we can even have arcs or rectangular clock sections, machined or otherwise. And then we can even go to magnets inside assemblies. Here, this is a lifter magnet. And we have magnets inside here, which by moving this lever, helps turn the magnetism on and off to help clamp and release. It's even possible to use magnets in repulsive configurations, such as this toy where the magnetic fields in the rotating part and the static part actually repel and push away. So we have this little plate at the end to stop the magnet pushing itself off. A good little guide is that typically the repulsive force is about half that of the attractive force, which ultimately depends on the configuration as to what performance you will actually get. At Eclipse Magnetics, we offer a wide range of different magnet grades for each material type, be it armico, ferrite, ceramic cobalt, or neodymium, or even the flexible and bonded. We can offer you every single grade of magnetic material there is. We can also custom produce to any size and shape and provide your accreditation, help you with your R&D work all the way through to mass production. And we even help you with making assemblies as well. So please contact us to Clips Magnetics for further assistance.